Okay, well, I call to order the January 16th, 2024 meeting of the Las Virginis Malbuca Governing Board. Will the Executive Director please call the roll? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Paul Grisanti? Here. Kelly Honig? Here. Penny Sylvester? Here. Alicia Weintraub? Here. The President Gold? Here. Thank Everyone you. is president. You have a quorum. Hope you had a nice holiday yesterday, remembering Martin Luther King Jr. and reflecting his teachings, reflecting on his teachings. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Marcella Marlowe, who joined our city as our interim city manager. She's a little bit late. She's stuck in traffic, but she will be joining us uh, momentarily. Um, now we're on to our next agenda item, which is the agenda, I mean, approval of the agenda. Um, does anyone have any changes to the agenda? If not, then uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you. Will the executive director call the roll? Paul Grisanti? Yes. Kelly Honig? Aye. Penny Sylvester? Aye. Alicia Weintraub? Yes. President Gold? Yes. Thank you. Uh, public comment period. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the governing board? No. Um, Terry, have you received any public comments electronically? I have not. Okay, since there are no public comments, we'll go to item number four, election of officers. Uh, the COG amended and restated joint powers agreement states a governing board representative shall be elected annually to the position of president and vice president at the first regular meeting of the governing board held in January of each calendar year. The terms of the office of the president and vice president shall commence immediately following the election and expire immediately following the elections, which are conducted at the first regular meeting of the governing board held in January of the following calendar year. The city of Agora Hills continues to serve as the COG treasurer. Thank you, Agora Hills. The nomination are now open for president. Um, I nominate uh, Alicia Weintraub as our president. I'll second. Thank you. Will the executive director call the roll? Paul Grisanti. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. Alicia Weintraub. Awkward, but I. <laughs> I was going to say, now's your chance. <laughs> and President Gold. 100% aye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, very much. Yay. Congratulations, Alicia. Yeah, Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. Um, before we go on to nomination of vice president, I want to take this opportunity to thank Aniko for all of her very, very hard work this past year. We've dealt with a lot of issues in the COG, um, and you've done a really good job um, steering the ship. So we just thank wanted you, to take Aniko. the opportunity to say thank, thank you. Thank you, Aniko. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now nominations are open for vice president. Are there any nominations for vice president? Okay, I'll nominate Penny. A second. A second. Ooh, we're, we're, lots of seconds. <laughs> if there are no other nominations, will the executive director please call the roll? Yes. Aniko Gold? Aye. Paul Grisanti? Aye. Kelly Honig? Aye. Penny Sylvester? Aye. President Weintraub? Aye. Congratulations, Penny. Hey, Penny. Thank you. Congratulations. Now we're going to move on to item number five, which is our consent calendar. The consent calendar items will be approved in one motion unless removed for specific discussion or action. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent calendar? I would just 
I would just like to make a note of the um, corrected minutes that uh, I sent out to the governing board and the city managers that reflected uh, Ray Pearl's attendance at the last meeting. It wasn't on the original agenda that was sent out. So that has been corrected. Great. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar with the corrected minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Um, will the executive director call the roll? Uh, who, who made the second? Anika. Oh, thank you. Uh, Paul Grisanti. Aye. Anika Gold. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now we are going to move on to information items. The first item is a presentation by Southern California Edison. Is Andrew Thomas on the line? I am on the line. Oh, there. I see you under Drew. Okay. I'd like to ask Andrew Thomas to introduce the representatives making the presentation. And then following the presentation, we can open it up to a Q&A. Thank you so much. And congratulations to uh, the new president. Um, and to the vice president and to this board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and happy new year. Our guest this morning is Xu Cheng, who is a senior manager in our race division, who is gonna give uh, some information and overview about uh, recent trends and rates and uh, be available uh, as will I about for question and answer. Yes. So we thank you for this opportunity. I know there are several nuances about rates. We'll focus on the issues that were asked in this meeting but I definitely welcome the opportunity to come back and share other updates as we go forward. So without delay, I will offer uh, the opportunity for Shu uh, to come on. And if she could be given uh, presenting rights, I believe she has six slides. Uh, I'll announce six, because it's almost like when you invite people to church, you gotta let them know when the pastor's gonna be, gonna be done. So six slides and then your Q&A. Uh, Shu, thank you for being on and the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sharing my screen. I just want to make sure that you guys can all see it before I move on. Yes. Okay, that's good. All right, because we don't really use Zoom in our company. I just want to make sure it's working smoothly. Um, thank you for the introduction, Andrew. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I, I am the senior manager of the rates operation team. I, just a quick background. I've been with Edison since 2008. I've always been in the rates group or what we call the pricing design and research group. Uh, my team mainly focused on the implementation of the rate factor adjustment that occurred a couple of times throughout the year. As Andrew mentioned, I'll be providing an updates of where we stand today. We recently had a rate change on January 1st, and then I'll also give you a little forecast of um, where we think we're headed for the remaining of the year. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before we go into the first slide. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, some forecasts, like I mentioned, of the remaining of 2024. H however, just keep in mind that a lot of the information that I share is still pretty fluid. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, application and proceedings out there. They're still pending for the commission approval. Uh, so what I share today is based on what we know today, but things are changing constantly as we go. Um, I, I'm not sure if you guys have great updates uh, presentation before, but if, if we do have future ones, I'm more than happy to provide any further update once we know more. Uh, with that, I'm going to go into our first slide. Um, so this is uh, what we call the waterfall chart. What it shows is where we stand for our bundled service system average rates. Uh, the way the chart reads is the blue bars represent items that are pending, and then and the green bars are items that have been approved and authorized. Uh, as you can see, the left-hand side of the slide are all blue greens. Uh, as we, as I mentioned, we already had a rate change on January 1st, so all of those numbers are confirmed. However, as you go further to the right of the slide, all of the numbers are still representing in blue, so those numbers could change uh, depending on when the final decision is approved. And also, the timing of it could also change. Um, as I go into more detail, like if something does not get approved on time, there's a possibility that uh, some of these items could be moved to a later date or some of these changes. Uh, with that, I'll start on the left-hand side. So as of last year, end of last year, where we stand was we 
our system average rate for our bundled customers is at 27.6 cents. There are a couple of things that went in our most recent rate change. Uh, the first item is what we call the GRC track four. Um, and this is GRC stands for general rate case. Uh, this is where we seek requests for our cost of op operation basically every four years. Uh, so 2024 is our last attrition year from the 2021 GRC cycle. Uh, another thing that's happening here in the first bar is uh, we have a memo account. Uh, so memo account is basically a uh, cost that we have tracked in 2021 because there was a delayed decision of a rate case. Uh, therefore, uh, we started recover some of the memo account costs in starting in 2022 uh, for about 27 months. As of last year, that memo account amount has been fully recovered. So we'll be pulling that out from rates on first uh, January 1st. The two items combined, uh, the track four and the memo account represent a net change of about 700 million increase, uh, which translate into a 0.8 cents uh, per kilo hours change. The next item, we call it the annual true up. This is where we look at all of the balancing account for the different components to determine whether we over or under collect for the previous year. Uh, last year, we accumulated a, a pretty significant under collection in our distribution balancing account. Uh, one of the main reasons of that is because last year we, we did have a relatively milder year. Uh, so our sales, our sales actually came in quite a bit lower than what we had originally forecasted. Another thing that was going on is in back in 2022, we actually had an over collection. So in 2023, we were actually giving refund back to customers, but that fully that refund has been fully exhausted by end of last year. So we'll be pulling in that refund out from rates on just on January 1st too. Uh, the net of those under collection from 2023 and the over collection from 2022 is about a 1.4 cents upward adjustment. And then the next item is what we call the SEMA application. So SEMA stands for Catastrophic Event Memo Account. Uh, this is where we uh, submit an application to seek recovery of any restoration efforts associated with um, catastrophic event. Uh, so these are uh, all of these costs are associated with event that occurred in 2019 and then part of 2020. Uh, some of these are drought events, firestorms, and even COVID events. Uh, we recently received an approval of about 200 million um, that will be put into rates. So we also put that into rates on January 1st, which is a 0.2 cents upward adjustment. And then we have some downward adjustment to offset some of the increases. The first one is our ERA change. So ERA stands for energy resource. Um, energy resource, so this is an application where we mainly seek changes to our gas and fuel and purchase power costs, as well as updating our sales forecast for the year. In 2024, we are forecasting lower gas price, uh, which is why we see that 0.9 cents downward adjustment. Then the next item is our transmission rates. So each year we are authorized to make adjustment to our base transmission rates. This year we're also seeing a decrease on that component, which is a 0.4 downward adjustment. The next item is EE and charge ready. So E stands for energy efficiency. There are a couple of things that are happening here. Uh, mainly for energy efficiency programs, uh, we did have some unspent committed funds, uh, which allows us to reduce our overall revenue requirement. We also put in place uh, two energy efficiency program or costs that started, that was put into rates back in 2021 and 2022. Both of those programs have been fully recovered as of last year. So we'll be pulling those two programs costs out from rate as well. So the three of them and some miscellaneous charge ready adjustment equates to a 0.3 cents, negative three, negative 0.3 cents adjustment. Uh, the next one is CSRP. So this is the customer service we platform. For those of you, you probably heard that we, we did a uh, rebuild a building system back in 2021. Um, so we had um, some costs accumulated from that and ongoing costs uh, that are related to capital spending. That's a 0.2 cents um, negative change. And then last but not least, uh, we also try to capture some of the miscellaneous items, uh, some other smaller changes all together in one single buckets. And that's another 0.1 cents uh, down. After all of those, uh, currently we stand at 28.2. Um, so our January 1st rate changed with about 2% for our bundled customers. Uh, I'll have a couple more slides in the next 
uh, next few slides that shows what it looks like for the different rate group as well as our unbundled customers. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I know I just shared a lot of information. I just want to make sure I pause here to see if there's any question on the January 1st rate change. <laughs> yeah. In, uh, in, pr in previous years, I've seen a, uh, a surcharge on my bill for undergrounding. And it's a relatively small amount that that accumulates over time, and then every four or five years, there's a a uh, undergrounding project for scenic beauty on Pacific Coast Highway. Are there any changes to that as a percentage of the of the wet rate, or is that a program that's older than me and it's never it's was eliminated at some point? You said it's an undergrounding charge. I'm not aware. And this is on the SE bill that shows undergrounding surcharge. Yeah, it's it's a surcharge to build up a reserve for that what was used for that. And they uh, they did a project on Carbon Beach uh, about four or five years ago, and then the uh, homeowners uh, taxed themselves to finish the job because it only did a certain amount of things, but Southern California Edison paid for a part of it, so. I need to check on that one. I'm not sure how okay. it's called out on the bill, but let me check uh, with our billing folks. So sometimes they do call out specific components, uh, which is different than what I'm presenting here. Um, okay. It may Thank be you. on the fast lane. I assume it's on the fast, we call it the fast lane, which is on the right-hand side of the bill that you're seeing the undergrounding charge, is that right? I, I don't have my bill with me, okay. so. I'm okay. I'm, uh, I'm operating from a admittedly not great memory, so. Okay, no worries. I'll yeah, like I said, I'll check with our building folks, and then I'll get you a written response, and then probably Andrew can share it with the team. Mm -hmm. If I if I could, uh, would it be possible? I I mean this with all due respect. This present this portion of the presentation is a little bit in the weeds as far as going through each. I mean, I think that just saying like a 2% increase for bundled customers, okay. which, you know, rather than doing each one point by point in order to um, expedite the, the sure. presentation. Of course. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, the that. rest of the presentation actually goes pretty fast. Usually this is the only side that I go through and then the rest is just, okay. I'll just pause okay. and then you guys can look at it. Okay. But Thank I'll speed you. it up. All right. So after the first rate change, we are anticipating three more rate changes. Uh, the next one uh, is the March 1st. We're expecting a roughly 3% increase. But as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, all of these has to go in if we get approval before March 1st. If it doesn't, it could get pushed to a later rate change. On June or starting the summer is when we're expecting to see some reliefs. Most of these items are associated with us putting putting out items from a rate. Uh, if all of those goes through, it's a 4% decrease in on June 1st of this year. And then the balance of the year, as you can see, it's very, very minor. Uh, but again, I keep saying it, but these are all very fluid and things could change, things could show up. So we'll, we'll provide update as we know more. All right, so this next slide is expanded version of the waterfall chart. Uh, this is showing our bundled service customers rate impacts, uh, as you can see. Displacement, fatalities, all that. Okay. Um, so what this chart is showing is our current or last year rates versus current year broken down by generation and delivery service. Uh, what it contains is impacts to our overall revenue changes as well as our sales forecast changes. So you'll see differences between the rate group depending on um, uh, how, how the rate groups performs. <laughs> Any questions on this slide before we move into the next one? So this next one is for unbundled customers. What this is showing here, uh, we don't show the generation portion of the bill for unbundled customers, rather it's only showing the deliver portion and the cost responsibility charge uh, for departing, uh, which is the PCI and CTC. Uh, the overall changes for unbundled customers is higher than bundled customers. The main reason of that is because most of the changes for January is associated with distribution only. Uh, so it have more impact because we uh, the generation rates are actually going down for a bundled customer. So when we look at the unbundled build, 
we're seeing an overall increases of roughly uh, 6% for pre o line vintage and then 0.3 cents for post o line vintage. All right, I'll quickly go. So the last two slides really, it's information only. This slide is similar to the information on the first slide. The only change difference here is it's showing it in dollars as opposed to cents per kilowatt hours. And I think this is my last slide. I, I think we included an acronym just to um, explain all, what all the different acronyms are and what it stands for. I have right. a quick question. I have a quick question. Is the um, could you explain the, like bundled versus unbundled? I mean, is the average homeowner bundled or unbundled? Uh, it depends. There is a mix. I mean, right now, I think for residential customers, I want to say it's about seventy percent, thirty percent split. But don't quote me on it. Uh, we still have a little bit more customers on on bundled service. Yes. We and by bundled, bundled. What, what does bundled mean though? I mean, what, oh, did, so what are they bundling? Not only, so they not they take service from SCE and also we procure power on their behalf. Uh, the unbundled are like the CCA customers who have departed from, um, who, who, who purchased the power from the, uh, I think we call it community choices aggregation, but they take, but SCE delivered the power to them. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. So could I follow up? So that means if we're getting like in Agora Hills, we get the CPA, the Clean Power Alliance. That's so an unbundled. We, that's unbundled. Thank you. Yeah. The only thing is on the unbundled. What like uh, what we're showing here is only the delivery portion of the bill, and a component we call PCI, which is a cost responsibility surcharge for departing. What it's not showing up here is the generation portion of the bill that CPA bills to customers. Can we get a can we get a copy of this slide presentation? Of course, yes. Thank you. Question: Do we have any information on that surcharge that that is being collected or was collected for undergrounding purposes? Do you have any information on that? Kendon was kind enough to to yes. send me uh, a note that says it's the Rule Twenty A. 20A allocation, and that's a mm. charge that's used to underground electrical lines. Okay. So, okay, Thank okay. You, now, now I understand that one. So, yeah. that is actually not part of this bill. So, but I can get back to you on whether where that surcharge stand today as a, it's compared to a couple of years ago. You know, there's a way to bring projects forward for those, or I don't know how that, that surcharge is, is being used. Would love to learn. Okay, I will get back to you on that. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. I'm more than happy to address any other questions so feel free to reach out to Andrew or myself. Thank you. Thank you, Shu, and, and thank you, Council. Um, Definitely, I'm going to stand in line for this regular call. And then, obviously, afterwards, if there are additional questions, we'll definitely follow up. Between myself or Shu, we'll uh, make the presentation available. And uh, much like what happens with me, a question will come up after uh, the time expires. So if something comes up afterwards, you can certainly follow up with me, and I can uh, do the direct uh, follow-up with Shu. Um, thank you for the time and, and availability. And we'll turn uh, the agenda back over to um, to Terry. So our next presentation is on the regional smart, smart cities fiber network. I would like to ask Jory Wolf and Will Murat to make the presentation and following the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. Thank you. Um, I have a, a PowerPoint deck that I will pull up. Um, it's only 62 slides, so bear with me. No, it's, <laughs> it's very short. Um, yeah, I, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Will Marat. I'm with InTrust uh, and EN Communications. We uh, are contracted by the COG to 
develop the design engineering for a uh, broadband project that would interconnect the traffic signals and create an ITS and intelligent traffic systems design across the, the five city region, as well as with some of the unincorporated county areas. Um, I'm joined by uh, Joy Wolf, who's our project executive. Um, and uh, both of us have been working on this project for some time. There's a, there's a team behind us. We're, we're working with design professionals and so forth. Um, but I'll just briefly kind of give you an update of where we are at with the project. Um, so um, specifically, the contract is a 165,000 foot underground fiber network. Um, interconnects the five cities in a redundant loop. So there's no single point of failure there. If somebody accidentally digs up uh, a cable at some particular point that it doesn't take down the entire network. Uh, we're going through the 30, 60, 90 from the high level all the way to the final design. The final design will include a bill of materials, stamps, bid package. Um, you'll see on the right there that we're trying to maximize the existing assets, whether they're city owned, publicly owned, county owned, um, or, or other assets within there. That includes existing fiber and conduit, some of which already exist, uh, looking at all the intersections, cameras, smart city technology, planned CIP projects, and uh, critically, the planned California statewide middle mile network, which is going to be running along US Highway 101, as well as down uh, Highway 27. <clears throat> so, um, what you see here, the circles are the traffic signals. Um, and then the blue, which you can kind of see in the background, are existing ITS projects that we've discovered. So there's three particular projects. Um, the Thousand Oaks ITS project uh, is in Agora Hills and Westlake Village, uh, basically going along Thousand Oaks Boulevard and down uh, Lindero uh, to past 101. There's the um, Hidden Hills project that you see out there. And then uh, the Malibu PCH project, um, that's running from Malibu basically to almost nearly to 27, Highway 27. Um, you can see there the kind of stages that they're at, basically early design, except for the Malibu, uh, sorry, um, they're in the design stage, except for Hidden Hills, which I believe the bids have already closed on the Hidden Hills project. Um, so they're in the process of reviewing bids. We did find some considerable assets. Um, the green that you see on the map is existing conduit, uh, probably going to require some upgrades and obviously going to require some new cable to be pulled. But the cost of upgrading existing conduits, vaults, and pulling new fiber is substantially less than having to underground all new assets, um, probably on an order of at least half or maybe more half the cost of what you would expect. The pink is existing fiber cables. There's a long run there in Agora Hills, and there's some significant runs in Calabasas. We're still in the process of analyzing how much of that fiber cable is usable and whether new cable would need to be pulled in. Again, if you have to pull new cable in, you're still talking about $20 to $25 a foot, as opposed to $130 a foot if you're undergrounding all new conduit, all new cable, all new boxes. So substantial cost savings we've identified there. Um, and then this is the high level design that was uh, fairly recently completed. Um, we've broken it out into two segments um, to ensure that both segments can be constructed, that with both segments will be independently operable, but connected to the others so that if one gets constructed first, you're not waiting around for the second segment. Um, this is the Highway 101 corridor segment. So you see we've incorporated the uh, Thousand Oaks design there as well as the Hidden Hills. We've incorporated existing fiber and conduit. And then the red there is the new underground that would connect more signals. In total, we're looking at 139 signals connected through this project, a majority of those uh, here on the Highway 101 segment. Some of these sections go out into the unincorporated areas, but are key uh, transportation corridors, commuter corridors that require some uh, connectivity and coordination with the county and with other cities to ensure not only traffic coordination, but also emergency uh, response. And the Malibu Loop would interconnect with the, the you'll see there in the turquoise, the planned middle mile project. Um, and then the Las Virginis Road undergrounding, which uh, is, is going to be um, 
challenging to some degree, but there was a lot of discussion about, you know, is it easier to go overhead on existing aerial lines? Yes, it is easier. Yes, it is less expensive, but it is more vulnerable. Putting this underground ensures that there's no, um, that a fire would not come through, a fire could come through, burn the poles, that would eliminate your connectivity there. So this is a much more resilient design using the underground. Um, it does add some cost, but we think that in the end, it's a much better asset for the, for the COG and for the community to ensure connectivity there. So the Malibu loop is connected so that there's no single point of failure here. It's connected up to the 101 corridor and, and along 27 and then the existing PCH project. Um, and then similarly, I'll go back real quick to the 101. There's interconnection points with the 101 middle mile network there that the state's building so that these are also similarly redundant. There's no single point of failure on either one of these segments. This is a summary just kind of uh, just for illustration purposes, uh, segmented out between different jurisdictions and the construction type. Um, so you'll see the total lengths for the 101 quarter, total length for the Malibu. Um, these are still, you know, subject to change. And in fact, they've changed just over the last couple of weeks as we find out more information through the low-level design. But the changes at this point are pretty minor. Um, we did do a little bit of horse trading with the county and their Thousand Oaks project uh, to ensure that this project would not be waiting around for the county to finish theirs before it could be operable. Um, so that changed some pricing a little bit, but in favor of the COG. And this is the total pricing, uh, basically 9.3 for the 101 corridor, 5.9 million for the Malibu loop. Um, these are preliminary pricing. You know, when we get to the final design, we'll have a full uh, bid package and bill of materials, and we'll have more accurate pricing. Typically, we're pretty conservative on pricing at this stage. Um, and, you know, for example, right now, we're assuming that all the fibers that all the pink on the map need, is going to need new fiber cables. That's pretty unlikely. Uh, I think we've already established that the Agora Hills has plenty of capacity there. So some of these costs will come down. Um, and again, we use a pretty high, conservatively high um, cost per foot at this stage because we're trying to make sure that we don't um, set anybody up for sticker shock when, they, when the bill of materials comes in. So we're working through that. Um, and right now we are in the 60% low level design stage. Our design team is going through all the details and uh, we should anticipate finishing that up in quarter one of 2024. Um, we're coordinating with the LA Department of Public Works and the Thousand Oaks projects, um, sharing assets and information with them and as making sure that nobody's recreating the wheel or duplicating efforts. And then the last next step is, is sort of thinking about the COGS planning for its broadband future. The, the networks that we have here are intended um, primarily because of the funding source to interconnect traffic signals because it's coming from Measure M so that LA Metro has that traffic nexus. But once constructed and interconnected for traffic, there's uh, more than enough capacity here for the cities to utilize these networks to interconnect city halls, public safety buildings. We've looked at water, wastewater assets, um, as well as potentially finding a private partner, a private ISP who might want to come in and utilize this backbone to get into some of the neighborhoods and create some uh, and, and offer competitive services uh, to compete with other ISPs. Um, to offer maybe a higher speed fiber gigabit speeds to residents, businesses, key business corridors. So there is a, a potential here for the COG to start thinking about once this asset's on the ground, this is a very valuable asset for a number of factors and um, perhaps soliciting, publicly soliciting a, a public-private partnership or, or seeking out uh, a long-term kind of strategic plan of how to utilize this network. It doesn't just have to be for uh, traffic control. Traffic control really is just one component of what a fiber, regional fiber network can do. And um, with that, oh, sorry, this was just kind of showing the broadband networks that it, it again, it's more than traffic. It's interconnecting your, your institutions, your schools, your, um, public facilities, your enterprise businesses, your key anchor institutions, hospitals, um, and ensuring that you have a, a true smart city network that could function off of that, including the wireless that could play off of that backbone. Wireless always requires the fiber backbone. So 
And with that, I'll, I'll open it for any questions or, or comments. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? No, again, I would just like if we could get a copy of, of the PowerPoint. I will send a copy to Terry right away. Thank yeah, you. I, if we could get a copy to like the um, the ACORN is interested in this regional project as a potential article. So you might want to view this as well. And I think it would be great for us to be able to provide updates to our individual councils on this. Yeah. Well. Agreed. Thanks, Alicia. Mm -hmm. Paul? Paul? Well, you, you said some things uh, about the Malibu project, but I, I believe it's actually under construction already. And uh, it, it may be. Uh, the last conversation I had was with... Uh, spacing name rob and rob Malibu Dubois, was yeah. yeah it was right around thanksgiving and i think he was just wrapping up a change order um so yeah they, they could be under construction already yeah they're they're doing trenching and, and burying cable right now so oh good to know great all right thank you uh, a couple of developments um, also uh, that, that are in the works. Uh, please know that the work that has been done thus far has been in, inclusive of um, data and also regular meetings with your public works departments from each of the respective cities uh, and also the county. Um, we are going to be planning and scheduling fielding teams uh, for each of the cities coming up here in Q1. Uh, and also there is a... Um, uh, a packet that has been assembled for the LA Metro Board for their approval uh, on the scope of work and for future funding of the project. Uh, and that is going before them, uh, before the board for approval this month. Are there any other questions? Thank I you. have a quick one, if you don't mind. You had mentioned Hi, this is Nancy with Assemblymember Irwin's office. You had mentioned cell service. How will all of this connection help with the cell service that's so spotty in, well, almost non-existent in Topanga, Calabasas has problems, Agor Hills has problems. Is there a connection between the type of service, the degree of service once this is all ready to roll? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, the cell companies are always going to rely on a fiber backbone to connect their cell towers. And the the more um, prolific, uh, the easier or the uh, that, that cities and counties can make it for those towers to be located in, in areas and, and get that backhaul um, and certainly in a way to reduce costs. So, um, what we've seen is when the private partner comes in, they, those private partners, they're already established ISPs. They usually already have existing relationships with your major, you know, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon. And so they can say, hey, I've got, I've got backhaul now into more areas, more neighborhoods. I can get into some of these canyons and these residential neighborhoods. Um, and that enables that cell carrier then to say, oh, okay, now maybe we can go ahead and build a tower there in that location. Uh, because we have the fiber backhaul. The other component is the small sales, the small sales, which are located typically on street lights. Um, they kind of look like a small little antenna on top of a street light. Um, they have a, a smaller range, but again, they use the fiber backhaul. So I think that's one advantage to bringing in a private partner who already has those relationships is they can definitely sweeten the pot. And, um, and you know, the benefit of all this is if it's a publicly owned network, then there's always an exchange there. So a private partner coming in is going to either, you know, perhaps share some revenue with the COG as part of the agreement for them to utilize the backbone or provide some in-kind benefits, in-kind contributions to the COG. Maybe they add additional networks, connect additional traffic signals, connect fire stations. So there's always a, an exchange there. And the more customers, the more <laughs> enterprises that your partner can bring on, um, the more robust the network ultimately becomes. Um, in some uh, uh, in some of the uh, previous weeks now, maybe even 
uh, for about a month, maybe a month and a half, we have been sharing information about this network with um, ISPs, uh, competitive new entrants um, in the area, in the region. Um, and they have expressed an interest in learning more and the timing of when this develops because uh, this fiber provides ample opportunity to partner with each of the cities to fulfill not only uh, wireless strategies, but also other smart city strategies and services uh, to residents and businesses. So are you saying this could be an income generator for the COG? It has a potential depending upon the relationships that you establish with the ISPs, yes. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, back to you, Terry. Thank you so much. Now we're going to turn to our next presentation, which is by Karen Swift. And we're so excited to welcome you back to the COG. Um, Karen used to be our Metro um, rep to the COG. So it's really nice to see you back. And I will turn it over to you for your presentation on the Metro Traffic Reduction Study. Thank you so much, Mayor Weintraub, and thank you. It's so great to be back virtually with you all. I did cover this COG from 2015 to 2020, so it's been about four years, but I still see some familiar faces, and Terry and I have maintained our friendship all these years, so um, thank you for having us. I am going to ask uh, Terry if you can give my colleague um, Anthony Chica power to share a screen. He's going to pull up the presentation. So I know from having covered your subregion for so many years that congestion is a big factor for you all on the 101, as well as the Z traffic that that cuts through the canyons over to PCH. So we are here with a presentation to talk about one of the many ways Metro is looking at reducing traffic and congestion. So my colleague, Mark Valianatos, executive officer from our Office of Strategic Innovation is here. We will take your comments to note about short PowerPoints and keep it moving along so we can allow time for question and answer at the end. Mark, off to you. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to the COG for the opportunity to share information about this study. Um, so this is a conceptual study about the potential for congestion pricing in LA County. It was called for in our strategic plan and initiated by the board in 2019. Um, if, uh, so, um, and we've done a series of public meetings in some of the impacted areas. Um, you can go forward. and go forward again. And so in 2019, we began to look at this issue. The reason that Metro is looking at pricing for roadways is that we get bad congestion, we get traffic jams, we get stress from people getting stuck in traffic because there is too many people on the busiest roadways is the busiest times. Um, our at Metro, uh, our assumption about the future of transportation is that the era of massive expansions of roadways and freeways is essentially over. And so we need to look at the demand side. And what you what we know from an experience of pricing roadways is that if you put a modest toll on a road, um, it can create a psychological signal to people to think about, should they drive at the busiest times in the busiest roadways? Or they, could they do it some other time in the day? Or could they take another type of transportation? And if just 10 or 15% of people choose not to drive at the busiest time and places, it frees up that roadway for the rest of the people who have important trips to take and makes their experience of driving much better. You can go forward. And so we are looking at um, a combination of sort of three pillars in the study. One is, could we have affordable pricing that would reduce congestion? Two, could we reinvest any net revenues if they exist in transportation improvements and alternatives to give people more choices? And three, can we design low-income assistance programs so that if there are in the future potential potential tolls on roadways, um, it would not create a financial burden to households who cannot afford it? You can go forward. We originally looked at 14 potential areas in LA County and have narrowed it down to, to four, excuse me, to these three geographies that we have studied through some modeling of, again, just potential for congestion pricing. And you can see those are the Santa Monica Mountains, downtown LA, I-10 West. I'll focus on the Santa Monica Mountain and I-10 West concept today. You can go forward. 
the Santa Monica Mountains concept um, would price the the 405, the 5, and the 101, and 12 arterial canyon roads in between the 405 um, and the 101. Uh, it does show good promise in terms of reducing congestion. You see here two different colors with two different modeling runs. The first in blue we did, assuming every driver would pay. The second in orange assumed that low-income drivers would not pay and HOV 3 plus would not pay. So three or more people in a vehicle would not pay. But you see, even in the second run, you see you know over 30% reduction in the, in the core metric of delays. Um, and again, the reason we did two runs and changed that assumption is we wanted to test in the second one um, about the equity benefits of exempting low-income drivers and sustainability benefits of potentially encouraging carpooling. You can go forward. Downtown LA, we can we can skip, we can pass through. The I-10 West would just price the, the I-10 between downtown LA and its terminus in Santa Monica. It would be like an express lane, but it would be all the lanes of, of the highway would be priced and you'd pay at different points. And this again shows some decent traffic reduction on the 10 freeway, which is an important corridor. However, it also it doesn't show up in this data, but we, we detected that there would be um, some spillover traffic as people tried to go off the freeway to avoid price points and then come back on. And that would cause um, more congestion on some parallel and diagonal surface streets near the freeway. So there's some challenges um, to that in terms of performance. The Santa Monica Mountains concept, what I showed, performs better in terms of um, achieving desired results without as much spillover traffic. However, there are challenges for any of you who know that geography and that there is not robust transit alternatives in that area because it's not an urbanized um, central area of the county. There's the red line, obviously, across between the valley and the LA basin, but there's not as many other bus services, rail services at the moment. So we understand that it's not something we can do without um, thinking about how to bring in much more transit um, and maybe the timing is not right right now. You can go forward. And so we are thinking through, um, we we did public outreach, we've done this modeling. We're combining the input we heard from stakeholders and the public with the modeling results to think what is the best way to, to look at each of these concept areas, the three we're studying, and make recommendations to the board about whether we want, whether we think that any of them should be advanced to more formal environmental review and study. We are looking, as I mentioned, at how we could reinvest funding in any of these areas if there's any net revenue to enhance transportation alternatives. And we're looking at what's the best way to design low-income assistance programs so that no households who need to drive and are low-income would be unduly burdened and have their mobility restricted. As you can see, actually, this ye little yellow dot here where we are should have passed over into the new year, as we all have. So in 2024, we're, we're thinking about additional analysis um, we're thinking about what we want to recommend to the board. Um, if our leadership wants us to go to the board and make recommendations and the board would choose to advance any of these concepts, we would then enter a new phase, which you can see is almost as long as we've already been working on it because it would require state legislation. If we were to seek authority for full road rate pricing, it would require state environmental review under CEQA and it would require federal environmental review. And the federal environmental review that New York Transit Authority has done for a congestion pricing concept they plan to introduce in the south part of Manhattan took three years. And so this shows us a fairly lengthy timeline in front of us if anything goes forward. And with that, I think we can go to the slide that shows our contact information and happy to take any uh, comments or questions. Alicia, <clears throat> if I could ask Mark a quick question before. Of course. Mark, I'm curious if, um, I mean, I understand the toll process, but if there's, if you're trying to reduce traffic and you put in a toll and people that can afford to pay the toll, pay the toll. And I think it's very important that low income people receive a break. And if they receive a break, then they're going to still drive. So it, it really seems like just from a, a lay person standpoint that it's going to provide a toll for low income people. It's going to provide a toll for everyone else. What's Metro going to do with that money that's generated? 
Good question. And again, just just to repeat myself that um, there's this kind of um, understanding from places that have congestion pricing and also understanding from our 10 year experience of doing express lanes that um, you you don't need to get everyone to change how they drive. And the goal of this project is not to stop people from driving. It's to improve the driving experience for those people who have important trips to make. And as I mentioned, it's just like shifting in people's minds. Like if I'm doing a marginal trip and by marginal, I mean like I'm going to the store to buy one thing. I might think, oh, if I have to pay a few dollars, I won't do it today. I'll go tomorrow and buy more things. And that frees it up for everyone else who's who's driving. Um, yeah, but they're, of, probably, but they're probably not going to be jumping on the freeway to go to the store. Right. Well, the 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 places where we're exploring congestion pricing, it's a common some are a combination of freeways and arterial streets. Some like the downtown are primarily arterial streets passing into downtown. And the 10 freeway itself is just a freeway. So we're looking at different options. But they what they all share in common is they have bad traffic where people lose portions of their lives stuck in very slow moving traffic. And so it's an it's a again a study about the potential for that to improve that driving condition. Um and then if we're using tolls to do that, as you're right, there there could be money left over. And your question was how we'd use the money that's left over. And so we have concepts from talking to our planning department, our operations department, and to stakeholders about what's the best way to use those funds. So it could be, in some cases or some locations, it could be to uh, expand the frequency of existing bus or existing rail. It could be to improve the customer experience by investing in things we know our customers want most, which is clean, safe, vehicles and stations. It could be to um, invest in and accelerate the construction of new um, fixed rail or BRT that's in the works. It could be to make uh, changes to streets to reverse, to avoid diversions off if there's pricing or to make, make them safer places to, to drive or to bike or to walk. So there's a whole host of things we could do. And we're not going to go um, to the board with, here's a a massive investment plan. We'll go with categories that could be good complements to any potential future pricing. Thank you. And Thank I you. see, I'll start screen the way the order is in my screen, Aniko and then Paul. Um, Thank you so much for the presentation. It's an intriguing project and I'm glad you're thinking about reducing traffic as we all suffer from, from it, the congestion. But I'd like to ask two questions as to understand where you're going with this. Have you considered population projection, which I'm sure you have? Um, are we growing as a city and the county? And, and, and how will this um, congestion pricing fit into that? Because we're thinking about years ahead, basically. So by the time we get there, where are we going to be uh, population-wise? Um, so just to avoid this uh, project lagging behind that growth if we are experiencing growth in our city and in, 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 in our county. And then I also like to, so that's my first question. The second part of my question is, can you please give us ideas about this congestion pricing? Like what would be just a couple dollars per trip or would it be like two, two exits, you pay $5? Like any, any concept around pricing and um, the length that you would pay for would be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, the modeling we've done uses the SCAG sort of regional travel demand uh, model, which is used for a number of transportation planning projects in the region by Metro and other agencies. And that does factor in sort of, um, you know, where people currently live and where they work and what type of trips they take. And it projects out in terms of economic growth, population growth. So, um, some of the the modeling assumed in the first round, like a potential 2025 start. Um, the second round assumed a potential 2028 start. We don't actually have a projected start date, but for the purpose of modeling, we're doing that. So it does take into effect that, take into account that. It does not take into account if we were to get money and invest in new projects, that would then change obviously travel patterns, but we could do that with different modeling in the future. So it's a decent starting point for understanding what's going to happen, but obviously, you know, as you implied, um, things change. Work from home actually obviously changed between our first round of modeling and second round of modeling. So we do have to be on top of that. And in terms of pricing, um, again, the goal is affordable pricing, which we we instructed our technical consultants to find the lowest price 
that would lead to that 10 to 15% reduction in demand in the most busy roadways, busiest times that I mentioned. So um, we, the pricing on some of the variants would be dynamic, which means that like in the middle of the night, there's not many people driving, it would be free. Times when it'd be busy, you would pay. Other, the model, um, part of the downtown model assumed a fixed price going into downtown. And that price was um, was fairly low. I'll give it just as an example. We don't have so... We don't have the exact price because it changes based on like an origin destination and time of day. But for the the MTA's congestion pricing plan for Manhattan that got approved in December, they have a daytime price of $15 and a nighttime price of $3.75. And our fixed pricing is, is the price that we modeled is below their nighttime pricing. Because again, we think that by setting a fairly modest price, it does get that small shift in driving patterns that can improve, prove it for improve the situation for drivers, and then in a win-win, we can reinvest in a way that helps people who are taking transit. So that's been kind of the goal. So I'm sorry I don't have an exact price for every trip, but we do through the modeling have sort of charts that show if you're starting at this point and that point, we can sort of estimate what it would be, both the price, which is the new charge that comes to people, but also the benefit in terms of the time reduction of that trip the increase in reliability um, and increase in speed on some choked points, for example, in the freeway network. Paul? Hi, Mark. I have a couple of questions. For starters, uh, to me, the 405, uh, having uh, something that tries to push people off the 405 means a, a certain number of them are probably going to join the people who are already uh, doing Z traffic and jumping on either Canaan or, or Malibu Canyon and then coming down Pacific Coast Highway and then going into uh, the city uh, through Santa Monica on the, on the 10, those kinds of things, uh, which results in more traffic for us. And you haven't looked at... Uh, at Malibu for this. And I'm thinking that one of the things that this could be used for in Malibu, if, if we had this, is the time between toll stations is currently used on the East Coast to issue traffic tickets for people who exceed, who uh, don't spend enough time getting from uh, pay station to pay station, and they end up getting a traffic ticket. Have you looked at that at all? No, I mean, it's a good idea. And, and on, the, on your first point, as I mentioned, we one of the things we ha we have looked at for different modeling runs is whether there's a potential for large scale spillover traffic, people avoiding points. And just as a context, we originally looked at two Santa Monica Mountain concepts. One is the one I mentioned, and one was just the 101 and the five. And in that one, we did see people diverting off onto the roadways more, you know, more, more inland along the, the, the mountain areas. And so this is why the more comprehensive version seemed to work better because by pricing most of the arterial roads, um, it then, there wasn't a point of get, of it made it much more difficult to divert off. To be fair to your point, um, since it ends at the four or five, we did not recommend suggested pricing um, arterial roadways further towards the coast. Mm -hmm. um, we did have in our 14 original concepts, one of them was, was PCH. We had a variety of different options to look at. We we sort of narrowed them down based on you no, know, we can only model a few, and we want to look at different options. But I like your idea that there could be co-benefits uh, if the technology is either in a gantry system in the future or a camera system in the future. It could have benefits for public safety in a variety of ways, whether it's issuing tickets or whether it's capturing license plates of you know that could help with law enforcement investigations. And again, we have not in this conceptual phase of the study looked at technology. That would be a future choice. We're just looking at the modeling, assuming there is some pricing and sort of in a vague area. Um, you know, we haven't picked the exact point of any pricing points. We haven't picked the exact price to the earlier question. You know, all of these things will be determined in a formal environmental process with a lot of technical analysis and public input. And again, that just assumes that if the board chooses to advance one of these, as I mentioned, each of them has some challenges and some opportunities. So we're not out here saying any of these will happen. But but I will will add to our notes and our thoughts um, that co benefit you mentioned. I I just had one really quick question. Are there any similarities to this and the new project in Orange County 
I mean, I know it's a different eight government agency. Which specifically, to, this would be a um, a toll toll road. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, th there, are, there's, there's, it's certainly it draws upon lessons from different types of roadway pricing. Um, so we've looked at places in the world that do have full congestion pricing, which tends to be sort of a ring around a ring around a downtown business district, like in Stockholm or London. We're looking at what New York is is exploring right now, or already passed. We've looked at the lessons from Metro Express lanes. Um, and we've looked at, you know, toll authorities in the East Coast, and we looked at sort of privately built or, or publicly built toll roads. Um, we view this more as a congestion pricing concept because it's it's focused at, at essentially where is the really bad traffic and how could pricing help that? And then all the other ancillary benefits in terms of reduced air pollution or increased roadway safety or in reinvestment in transit and other alternatives kind of follow on from that benefit. Um, but I think it's a good point that we could connect with them more directly and see what their modeling is showing, see what some of their results are from existing priced roadways, because um, we do want to learn from the best, the best real world projects. Great. Thank you so much for this presentation. Could I ask one question? Because um, having grown up in and around London, where they have congestion pricing, you don't need a car in London because there are so many buses going in so many different directions. There's the underground, there's the above ground railway. Um, we live in Agora Hills and Westlake Village and, and Malibu. There, there are none of those public transport options. So how are you going to stop people driving when you're not giving them anything else to use instead of their cars? Yes, that's a great point. And we have a slide in a longer presentation that shows some data points from London, Stockholm and Metro Express lanes. And when we give that slide, I make the point of saying we're not London, we're not Stockholm, we're not South, we're not Manhattan south of Central Park. All those places have robust, you know, very, very old and extensive uh, subway systems. Um, and so this is also what I said about the Santa Monica Mountains concept. There really are not alternatives. And our goal of this would be to find an area where there's alternatives either already existing that we can supplement or that we would have funding from this to bring them in by the start of any pricing. We are 100% do not want to bring in pricing and then people you know, have no other way to get around if they want to avoid a toll. Um, I will say, of course, that if someone can afford tolls, you do get something of a benefit in terms of your, it's a trade-off time. Do you value your time or you value a relatively small amount of money? Um, and some people might be like, please bring this because then, because I hate being stuck in traffic, it's worth it. Others might be, it's unfair to charge us for something that's currently free. I'm willing to sit in the traffic um, versus pay for it. And we understand both points of view. But I do assure you that the whole premise of it is we cannot just bring in pricing. We'd have to make sure that people would now have a, a fast, rapid, reliable way to, to move on that route they previously took by driving without, you know, without having to need their car so um, that'll, Mark, be, that'll be included in our recommendations to the board. Mark, Mark, on that subject, what's the average speed right now on the 405? I don't know, but if you want me to to find that from- Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm saying yeah. what, what I want to know is, it you know, if we spend a lot of money and it reduces traffic 10%, so I'm not really sure that a 10% reduction is significant enough well, to- in increase people getting around. And so my, then the follow-up to that is if, if it only reduces at 10%, then do you start like upping the, the toll more frequently to a higher amount in order to get people to use other methods? We, well, actually this is a great point. And I realized in my longer slides, I do have some data. So I'm just looking at them right now and we can share this if you want. So we have, um, for the for northbound I-405 of Mulholland, our original round of modeling showed a plus 19, increase in speed of 19 miles per hour. Our second shows an increase of 13 miles per hour. So I'm not sure what that is a percentage, but it seems like that'd be a significant increase. Um, and US 101 shows an increase in 14 miles per hour or 10 miles per hour. So assuming that those are stuck at fairly low speed, that may be a doubling of speed, right? Um, so it's not bad, but, I, but your point applies across the board. Um, if we're giving a, if it's a fairly high price and a low time saving, it's not worth it. If it's a low price and a high time saving, it's worth it. And we're probably somewhere in the middle. 
And a question, as you said, is like, would we keep having to push up the price to get good results? And really it's a triangle between what is the price, how many people are exempting, and what is the performance benefits to, to actual drivers in terms of reductions? And those are the levers or the knobs we can turn. And our ideal will be to have a fairly modest price, have exemptions for those people who need it, but not so many people that, that we'd require to push up the price for everyone else and get good results. And this is the kind of information, again, we'd be making in recommendations, like what is the best sort of combination of those that might achieve good results? And then, as I said, if it's advanced to more formal review and design, we try to do the best combination of that, taking into account what people want, which of those should we prioritize, what's the best performance, what are comparisons we can take from existing um, pricing schemes, as we've heard. So it's not easy, but it is promising. I would say that. Are there any other further questions? Well, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. So now I'd like to ask Terry to give his executive director's report. Thank you, President Weintraub. Uh, the first thing I'd like to touch on with my uh, executive director's report is the homeless count. Uh, the Los Angeles County Homeless Services Authority, known as LASA, has opened registration for the 2024 Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count. Um, this will occur for our region uh, for, uh, along the 101 um, on Tuesday, January 23rd. That's for the San Fernando and San Gabriel Valleys. And uh, I've been coordinating with LASA. Gabriel's been a big help on, uh, and so has Michael McConville in uh, Calabasas to uh, not only host the central uh, meeting location for the count in Calabasas, but also have a couple of a one or two satellite. Um, I know that uh, Agoura Hills has uh, committed to a site, and I believe that uh, Westlake also. What uh, Gabriel and I have discussed is that uh, we would have the uh, LASA would, and we would coordinate the volunteers going out from Calabasas. And then Gabriel, instead of having in Agoura Hills and Westlake Village volunteers that would uh, drive all over the city uh, in areas that we already know there's no homeless people, that Gabriel... Um, would highlight the areas, two or three areas in each city where there's uh, been homeless uh, activities. And then that would be easy to drive through that area in order to determine if there were any unhoused individuals uh, in those jurisdictions. But the main point uh, of contact for the evening would be in Calabasas. And um, I'll be coordinating with Gabriel and uh, Michael and uh, the other cities uh, the rest of the week in order to fine tune all of the information. And if any of the governing board members would like to participate, uh, please let me know. I know that uh, Alicia and Gabriel and I uh, were on a team last year. We, we brought along James Bazajian as our navigator and, uh, and we had a, a really uh, interesting evening cruising around. So uh, it's a couple of hours and uh, it's just kind of, uh, uh, you know, good government kind of stuff that that we do from time to time. So I just wanted to uh, ask if you would like to reach out to me either uh, uh, after the meeting or anytime this week, um, happy to uh, coordinate that and, and plug you into a spot. Um, moving to the hazard mitigation plan, the uh, the COGS hazard mitigation plan was scheduled to be completed at the end of the year, and uh, for the most part it was. There were some additional comments that were being added, um, and the consultant was uh, planning to have the cities post it on their websites for the last week of the year. And I really felt from a transparency standpoint that that really wasn't a good idea that, you know, we might uh, receive some criticism that we, that nobody was looking at it uh, during that period. So the 
all of the COG cities uh, are posting it um, in the first part of January. I know that uh, several uh, cities have already done that. And we were going to wait until after the um, the posting in order to submit it. But in talking with the consultant uh, last week after the agenda was finalized, what the consultant has done is sent the uh, draft hazard mitigation plan to Cal OES because they always have comments that have to be incorporated into the plan once it comes uh, after they review it and it comes back to uh, the COG and the consultant. And so uh, the consultant and I were discussing that if there were any public comments that came in as a result of the hazard mitigation plan being posted, that those comments could then be considered and possibly added when the um, the draft comes back from the initial review at Cal OES. And then the process would be after Cal OES reviews it, if there's any comments, those would be included. It would be resubmitted to Cal OES and then forwarded to FEMA. And FEMA is the area where uh, it, it takes a little bit longer to get um, things approved, but we've been assured by the consultant and, and by the staff that we're working with that uh, we should be able to meet our deadline, which is August, the end of August this year, in order to have our new hazard mitigation plan in place. Um, regarding Measure M and Measure R, um, the COG Measure M funding allocations as approved by the governing board will be approved later this month at the Metro meeting on January 25th. And that would allow Hidden Hills to immediately begin work on their uh, fiber uh, backbone, which is basically the first phase of the COG project. And then the, uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out in working with Malibu on their Measure R projects, the different from Measure M, Measure R projects, which is an uh, older funding project, their um, they would like to move an additional 1.8 million for a total reallocation for their PCH signal synchronization project uh, at 3 million. Uh, unfortunately, the request uh, with Rob and I going back and forth, it came in too late in order to get it on the Metro agenda for this month. However, uh, I am coordinating with Malibu and Metro and they will be able to get it approved by the June Metro meeting which works for Malibu as far as the funding being uh, available. So uh, that's uh, that's good news. Uh, the other, we had the regional smart cities fiber network project uh, presentation today. So that's uh, moving forward. And we expect to have that completed within uh, 30 to 60 days and then move forward with uh, putting it out to bid Obviously, it would come back to the governing board for review and everything, and then uh, we would put it out to bid. So that's uh, very exciting. Uh, and then the traffic reduction study we just heard about. And um, Measure H uh, is kind of interesting. The uh, The county is, as we all know, uh, put forth Measure H in 2017 uh, for the quarter set sales tax, which was approved by the voters for uh, homeless initiatives. Uh, the county is now uh, appears to be taking a backseat to uh, a group that is led by the uh, CEO of United Way. And uh, along with some other people, uh, one of them from Pop Popix, which you might recall um, had some bad press recently about their um, inability to pay for leases that they were contracted with from LASA that resulted in a number of people uh, being evicted. Um, and so uh, it just it, it just became a concern to me and I would uh, recommend to the board that we have a presentation by Supervisor Horvath's office uh, maybe next month to explain why the Board of Supervisors is not taking the initiative on this because it really allows um, United Way and these other people that are putting it together to divvy it, to divvy up the pie and uh, include that in the initiative that then would be submitted to the voters. 
So there's a, a lot to unpack with that. And uh, I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention uh, as we move forward this year with uh, homeless discussion and uh, related activities. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Terry. And I think that's a good idea to have Supervisor Horvath's office um, respond to that. Now we're gonna turn to public safety, legislative and agency partner updates. Um, we're gonna start with Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Captain C2, is Jen on the line. And we can move ahead to LA County Fire with Chief Smith. Well, good morning. Happy New Year to everybody. I'm on the road, so um, you don't get to see my happy face today, but it's a great day. And uh, so with LA County Fire, good things are happening. Uh, we're motivated about this new year. We're continuing with some robust training, especially that affects uh, the COG. What's up? And I'll speak for and with Captain C2 on this is our unified approach for the all-risk incidents. Uh, really focusing this year on really focusing this year on enhancing our evacuations, notifications, all that on our partnership with within the county family, but also extending to Ventura County Fire, LA City Fire, LAPD, Public Works, Santa Monica. So that training will be coming that we do annually and quarterly, but we do a big, robust. Um, annual meeting and that's going to come in May to June and of course like last year uh, we will ask select members from the cities to see how we perform in an active role for wildfire how we look at what is what was once called uh, zone haven and the genesis connect feature how that looks how the flow of information goes unified messaging so that'll be coming. We're in the planning phase for that from lessons learned and enhancements that we're doing. And other than that, we are um, on January 22nd, gonna be transitioning all of our radio systems to a significant upgrade, which will really enhance our features of interoperability and also our um, communications network will give us more of a robust communication system with as least amount of dead spots, if you will, in the Santa Monica Mountains. So that's really exciting for our communications upgrade. And with that, um, I'll entertain any questions you may have. Any questions for Chief Smith? Looks like no questions, but thank you so much for the updates and good um, news regarding limiting the number of dead spots. Yes, and uh, thank you for the support. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, next, we have um, Supervisor Horvath's office. Do we have Sophia or Barry on the line? Okay, we'll move ahead to CHP. Um, Casey Ramstead, who's the PIO in the West Valley Station. Hi uh, there, Officer Ramstead here. I'm trying to see if my video will work. I don't know if it will. Oh, it is a little bit. There you are. I'm trying to find a quiet place in this office. There is no quiet place. So um, as you know, as you probably heard in the news, we do have our contract coming up with uh, Malibu. It's still in the works. It has not been finalized. So we're just waiting for that last little bit. Uh, we've had our officers go out and uh, do enforcement on PCH uh, after the large accident that happened right next to Duke's. Uh, I was out there on Saturday and I mean, same thing. It's still a lot of the same 65, 70 miles per hour, uh, easy to write tickets. Uh, same thing with the construction zones. I talked to, um, multiple residents and everybody, even the people that we wrote tickets to were extremely appreciative. Uh, they appreciate the efforts that are going on. There are Why multiple are communities. Yeah. What's that? No, I think someone just didn't have their mute on. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the community has been very receptive. It's been very appreciated. I know that there's those signs all down PCH, uh, the speed speed limit, uh, speed zones. It tells you what your current speeds are at. So there's really no excuse for it. As I've told everybody, it's really easy not to meet us. Just kind of follow the rules. But uh, people keep wanting to meet us. 
Um, so we're hoping by February that we will have the contract in, well, but we're hoping by next week we'll have the contract in place. But, uh, until then we are still doing our deployments out there as, uh, as we can. Um, we're trying to get some more, uh, the, um, uh, contract, well, more setups to get a couple officers down there in the meantime. And, uh, so far it's been pretty effective. Uh, same thing with the construction zones. Um, there are multiple other communities in the canyons i'm going uh this sunday i'll be with the uh, lobo canyon triumphal canyon and meeting with them about uh their a new initiative they're trying to get people to slow down in their neighborhood uh they've been talking with uh, the all the engineers and everything else and so now i'm coming in to try and talk to them i'm working on a presentation about the uh dangers of driving recklessly and uh yeah and that we're we're trying any any method we can i'm hoping to start within the next month or two a well not next month because I'll be on vacation, but after that, a uh, presentation for Start Smart, which is um, uh, basically for any of the young drivers that get tickets, uh, work with the court system so that they have to get signed off. They have to go to a, a Start Smart presentation, which is with me, helping them realize the uh, safety things that they need to do for driving and the dangers that happen when you drive recklessly, drive uh, uh, making poor choices. So. We're working on a lot of different things, got a lot of moving parts and just hoping to get uh, more working, uh, working with the communities with that. Uh, I want to focus my presentation more on the canyon roads, uh, just because that seems to be where our big problems are and uh, waiting to see what happens when the snake opens up. And I just had a question and now I see Captain C2 on. So my question might be perfect timing, but your deployment, how will your deployment work like in the canyons? different than our sheriffs? Like what determines where CHP goes versus LA County sheriffs? In our, ent our entire plan is to work with sheriffs on this. We're mm -hmm. not working against them. And it's, if they find uh, trouble spots that they think that uh, we can better, we can, uh, we can work, work on, or we can uh, double up it. There's no, there's no stepping on toes here. It doesn't really matter. We can be in the exact same spot, but we want to, I think, uh, we want to be seen a little bit of everywhere. So okay. if sheriffs are in one spot, then CHP will probably be in another spot. We want it so that everybody thinks that no matter what, they got to follow the rules. Otherwise they're going to get in trouble. And then hopefully everybody slows down. That's, right. I mean, that's the overall goal for this whole thing. <laughs> because in, on, in Calabasas specifically for our city, we have Mulholland highway, which becomes like a raceway. And then it goes from city to County, you know, then down to Malibu, but it starts mm. here and we would love some extra support with <laughs> you'll be getting extra support especially with the snake opening up there's going to be extra officers on Mohon uh when that uh when they're looking to open that up in april um but i mean right now we have one to two units that are down in the canyons uh sheriff has their units deployed in the canyons and as as i try and tell everybody wherever we are we're getting uh calls for racing street racing drag racing um reckless driving somewhere else and then we go to that location and then we'll get calls for the exact same thing at the lake location. We just, we just went, whatever it is, we're, we're firefighters here. We're responding to the fires. We go over there, we write a couple tickets. Now their problems are, are three miles east of us. And we're going over there. We're going to stunt Mohon, Triumpho, Lobo Canyon. It doesn't matter wherever we are, the problem has now transferred to somewhere else. So it's just constantly going out and putting out fires. Great. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Paul? I just want to say how much we appreciate your presence uh, reinforcing the sheriffs in Malibu. And uh, please keep up the good work. And uh, the other thing, yesterday on my drive to work, I had two different people do U-turns from the curb in front of me. And it's, it's a, a deadly thing that people do. And it's totally illegal. And uh, if you can mention it to your your people in the field uh, that they um, these people don't seem to pay any attention to who's coming so yeah it's it's an easy ticket let me put it that way all we, you have to do is wait for them to try and kill you and then absolutely. you ticket them yeah we do we do definitely focus on speed but uh we are I, I, every time we deploy i tell my officers we're just uh, we're focused on what's called pcf primary collision factors so it's any type of driving 
actions like that that are has the potential to cause an accident or we would find is the reason that the accident happened such as a illegal u-turn running a red light driving in the shoulder anything like that they were like because of those driving actions you're getting a ticket that's what we're focusing on we're not going out there trying to write front plate tickets we are out there trying to write any pcf any speed anything like that those are our priorities so i'll let them know that that's one more thing to look out for but i'm sure if it happens to one of my officers that person's getting pulled over Thank you so much. And now I'll turn to Captain C2. Okay. Thank you very much. I actually have to log off right now, but you guys have a great day and I'll see you on the next meeting. Great. Appreciate you being here. Great. Like my partner said at, uh, from CHP, we are working together. We're having meetings with um, the lieutenant and making sure that it's a uh, it's seamless and our deputies are working together. Once we get the Malibu station open, um, they even asked if they could um uh, deploy out of the station. We of course said absolutely yes. We would, um, you know, to me, there's going to be no difference between CHP and LA County Sheriff's Department. We are looking forward to working seamlessly with them. Um, uh, we have the 21 miles in Malibu showing on Thursday. I'm sure uh, Steve uh, covered that, and I'll be part of the panel speaking. Um, as we had a traffic collision and it was like more, it was um, towards the high school. Um, Steve, are you where you remember that traffic collision? Um, it was about a week ago. I'm sure um, Paul or Steve does. Um, the car flipped, high rate of speed, young kids. Well, um, ended up being that the kid was a, a friend of um, one of my girlfriends. And um, so right now we are trying, I guess he has staples all over his head. His face is all messed up. He goes to a local high school. Um, so right now we're trying to work with um, this this kid to see if he would like to actually partner with us and um, be more of a spokesman and take a stance and work with Michelle Shane's group. So we're just trying to look differently about how we're addressing the situation when it comes to um, collisions and really trying to target um, the kids that are racing in our communities, as well as everything else we're trying to do. Um, Caltrans has been out here. We've been meeting with Caltrans, um, um, probably uh, weekly conversations with Lee from Caltrans. He seems very, very dedicated. So that's, um, I've never had this relationship with Caltrans before. So that makes, um, that makes me happy. Um, today at 11, I will be, and again, I apologize for being late, um, 11 o'clock, I will be meeting with um, uh, two people to discuss school safety. Um, I know as we talk about collisions and everything else that's going on in our community is let's, um, let's make sure that we still keep our eyes on our kids. And so school safety is something that um, I know is near and dear to Alicia's heart and uh, mine as well. So um, I'll be meeting with Chen Rogers. Uh, she is the mom of um, the Isla Vista school shooter, and she has been touring the country and talking about how to prevent these from ever happening. And so it's, again, it's a different take um, on how we're addressing school safety. Um, and you will be reach, you will be receiving call city managers regarding the real-time crime and disaster center. Um, so we have a meeting scheduled with Pepperdine. I know we are working closely um, with Agora Hills and Calabasas. And um, so thank you for your partnership, but we're really looking to get that onboarded as soon as possible. And um, we did do two operations, uh, traffic operations in the canyons and on PCH, uh, where deputies had 52 tickets that were just from speeding in a short period of time. I think it was like four, four hours. And then the next day they had 32 tickets. So you know, that's why I'm really pushing for those speed cameras. And I just really appreciate everybody that's on this call that has um, supported the idea of speed cameras, because, you know, if you're down 30% at a station, and this is what's happening nationwide, it's not just my station, um, we've got to fill that gap with something. And that's where I do believe technology, um, engineering, and education um, definitely could fill that gap. So thank you all. And um, do you have any questions for me? Um, I, I have a question, Jen. Uh, just as a follow-up, the individual that was found deceased last week at the Rosadobi car wash, 
What was that caused by them being homeless, or was that a uh, were, were there other factors involved? Um, let me look at the. Um, I don't know if that has been determined yet, Penny, but um, let me look at that, and I will get back to you on that. Thank you. And thank you from all of us for all the work that you and everyone at the station is doing. Thank you. If there's no more questions for Captain C2, I will um, move ahead to League of California, League of Cities uh, monthly update with Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to kind of update everyone on what's happening uh, the first month back in the new year, back in the legislature. Uh, you may have seen some information I put out or, or uh, in the news. Uh, the governor released his uh, budget proposal last week. Uh, you know, the, the legislative analyst office, uh, $68 billion, the biggest in our uh, uh, for what it does have, uh, he's a billion dollars less than that at just uh, 37.9. So uh, it's it's going to be an interesting budget season to see where we end up. Um, the uh, Cal City is still for the years pushing. Sorry, Jeff. I'm not sure. Is it is anyone else having trouble hearing Jeff? I am. Can you try moving a little closer to the microphone? Uh, now you're freezing. Yeah, I think he's having a connection issue. You know what? Well, Jeff is fixing his connection. Um, Kelly actually has an update for the group. So I'll turn to Kelly and then we'll come back to Jeff. Okay. Um, so my update is I went to the legislative tour, the Contract Cities legislative tour last week in Sacramento. It was actually very good. Um, uh, three, The three high points that were... Um, uh, the main emphasis of the event were uh, the governor's budget, as Jeff just said, the, you know, the projection um, and the message that we're not going to be getting any money from anybody this year. Um, second was how housing and homelessness, you know, our ongoing problem. They had a panel on that, which included our representative, Ben Allen. Um, and uh, a couple other people, uh, and last retail theft, which was a huge problem everywhere. Um, that was the main, the the three heavy hitters that the membership wanted to hear from. You know, we heard from 10, 12 different legislature legislators from the assembly and the senate throughout the days, what their plans were, what their emphases were. Um, one thing I did want to touch on, um, and maybe Jeff can comment on this if he can get back online, and that is the bill that's pending that will cap the, lim the uh, uh, fundraising limits for elected local elected officials at $250, which is not applicable to our assembly members and our senators. The membership was definitely opposed to that and wanted to hear more on that. So maybe Jeff can speak to it if we can get him back. Um, last but not least, I did get a lot of feedback from the Contract Cities membership on why no one from our area goes to this. Um, I was the only one from our entire COG. Um, in fact, the closest person geographically to me was from West Hollywood. Um, so they're really, they really, um, they actually sat down with me on three separate occasions to ask me how we could increase our interest in this event, which I think is worthwhile. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I told them to come to the COG next year. Registration opens up in September, I think. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? I have a question for you, Kelly. Yes. Uh, I've gone to several of the uh, those meetings, and it seems that they're always held at least two and a half hour drive from where I live. I don't yes. know where that meeting you went to was held. Sacramento. Yeah. Okay. The one, the local ones are are always mm -hmm. in the most distant portion of Los Angeles yeah. for me. They are. Yeah, that is true. Which is a problem that we suffer from all the time. 
right. in our area. Um, they know that. Um, that's okay. something I suggested. Uh, you know, the, the, the core membership of Contract Cities definitely seems to be South Bay um, over there. You know, their officers are from there. So, yeah, it's definitely an issue. It's far. I explained to them. We're far. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff is back. Thanks, Kelly. And Jeff, it looks like you're back. I know. I don't know where I where I, I dropped off, but I assume pretty early. Uh, I, I was just trying to mention that the governor's uh, budget, uh, you know, comes out or he, he proposed it last week. Uh, $37 billion deficit is what he pegs it at. Uh, the LAO puts it at $68 billion. Uh, we've been asking for $3 billion in ongoing housing and homelessness funding. Uh, four cities directly. Uh, last few years, the governor has uh, put in a billion dollars for the HAP program, uh, and, and that's what we're looking at again this year. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a survey of our membership here in the next uh, few weeks to talk about uh, so we can get good information about what each city is spending uh, so we know what we can go back. We, we need some data to go back to uh, the governor's office and say, look, we really need this this funding. Uh, we're we're already spending a lot of fun of, of money out of our general funds, uh, and, and again, I think that that uh, dovetails well with the discussion we were talking about with the supervisor uh, Horvath's uh, office too, because that a lot of those local funds are also not getting uh, in, to helping cities uh, dealing with some of these uh, problems. Um, I'll kind of leave it there while my internet is stable, but I'm uh, happy to answer, ask, or yeah, uh, answer any questions, Kelly. Yeah, hi, Jeff. I I was talking about the legislative tour. Um, what's up with the the the, the 250 cap on the um, on the uh, uh, fundraising for locals, but not state assembly? Well, can you speak on that? They're very opposed to it. Everyone is. I had not heard that that was kind of still percolating um, in, in, within contract cities, but that is something that uh, Cal cities are, you know, our uh, city clerks uh, took a look at that piece of legislation and didn't flag it at all. Um, hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I, just, you know, sorry, that sorry. actually went, that was, that became law uh, a year ago. Uh, so right. that was as part of the law last year. Um, yeah, they're very unhappy. I mean, the members, when I went to the legislative tour, universally, they are very unhappy about it, made it known, um, all, you know, they being all of us, because it does not apply to our state representatives, which is kind of a problem uh, in their opinion, and that um, they're, you know, self-funded campaigns and also PAC contributions. So they're looking for some... Uh, workarounds on this you know that's that's what I'm hearing I'm hearing so I just thought I'd put that out there no I appreciate that I will uh, I will uh, check in with some of our lobbyists and see if uh, there is any movement uh, right. on that issue uh, I will mention also we are uh, still sponsoring AB 817 it's a block of Pachenko bill uh, you may recall Blanca was our uh, LA County Division president this is a Brown Act bill uh, it does look like it's going to get out of uh, the assembly before uh, the 31st, uh, the deadline in two weeks to get out of the assembly for that bill. Um, looks like that one is starting to move. That would put local, uh, it would put local cities on the same footing as state agencies with regard to when they can meet virtually, um, not necessarily having to open up uh, every single location to the public. So we're, we're actually very pleased uh, that that one is, is moving again. Uh, and we're hoping that we'll get uh, the same sort of reception in the Senate that uh, allows local uh, agencies to also work on the same um, scheme as the state has set up for themselves. And I think Paul had a question, but he's disappeared from my screen. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was, city of Malibu passed a 250 per person limit, 500 for a couple, probably 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, it, I'm sure at the time it seemed generous, but there has been inflation and things like that. And, uh, and the, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not new to us in Malibu, but it's uh, 
if it's it's for everybody at the state at the residential at the city level that's that's very interesting and, and what the rule really is is if you receive a 250 dollar contribution you may not vote on any decision that comes uh before you from that person or that entity uh so it's not uh it's not a, a, a max limit necessarily, like I think Malibu has, but it, it does require that the, the person receiving the contribution cannot uh, take, a, take a vote on anything, any business coming before them from that person. So I should advise my supporters to only uh, donate $245. Yes. <laughs> That that is the the, the uh, that is the difference. You really do have to pay attention. You really have to be up on your fundraising numbers. Uh, it is it, it makes things uh, complicated. Uh, you know, a lot of especially the 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 challenge we saw is that this bill was not really considered, uh, and, and this change was not considered with the uh, you know the elections that we had last year, and people were really scrambling. They were unclear if they had to. Uh, you know, abstain from votes based on contributions that they received before the law was actually in effect in, back in 2022 for the 2023 year. But uh, they did, the FPPC did rule that that was not necessary. Um, so really, I think that may be why Contract Cities uh, brought this up again. It really is uh, is going to be coming uh, and much more ubiquitous uh, for elected officials at the local level. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we're um, running over time, but are there any other updates from legislative staff and agency partners? Okay, then we'll move on to our action item, which is, yeah. a... oh wait, did someone want to say something? Hi, this is Stephanie with LA Metro. I just want to thank you again for giving us the opportunity to speak today. And of course, I'd be happy to speak to any of the other projects that were mentioned. Um, so I'll work with Terry to schedule those. That'd be great, Stephanie. We'd appreciate that. And really quick, I just wanted to add, of course, we're back. One of the things we're bringing back from a previous legislative year is our retail theft bill, which the old Public Safety Committee had killed. And we think it will work this time to get through the committee. And what it does is it allows the final amount to go across jurisdictions. Say you get $940 at Agora, and then you go over to LA, you can get maybe 50 more dollars, and then you can be, that limit will go across jurisdictions instead of just one place. So that's coming back on. Um, the wealth tax bill has been put to bed. That's not moving any further. And uh, we are working with Senator Ellen's office on a bill about the speed cameras and also a letter to Caltrans with some focused money for Malibu for PCH work. That's it for us for right now. Thanks, Good to Nancy. see you all. And Nancy, when your office needs support on these bills, will you let us know? Oh, of course. Okay. So especially like the retail theft bill, how, what we can do to support that. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, back to action item. We're going to confirm the Metro MOU increase in reimbursement for 2024 for Metro Board Deputy. Terry, will you present this item? It's a it's a very simple item. I'm not really sure that it, it even needed to go to the board because it was included in the original uh, memo, uh, MOU that uh, we signed with Metro. But since there was an increase, I wanted to bring it to your attention, at, at least uh, so you could confirm that and uh, understand that that's, you know, part of the, uh, or, or that's why the increase is, uh, is going forward, that it's just uh, from Metro increasing the contract overall, it increases our reimbursement, and then uh, it allows us to fund uh, Vivian Rescalvo, who took over this year uh, from Maureen Micheline. So I would recommend that uh, the board approve or confirm the increase. Okay. Is there a motion and a second to confirm the MOU increase in reimbursement for 2024 for the Metro Board Deputy? 
Penny Sylvester so moves. Is there a second? second. Paul, um, yes. you roll call, Terry. Aniko Gold. Aye. Paul Grisanti. Aye. Uh, Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub. Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Great. Are there any comments or requests for future agenda items? Are we going to hear from our cities? Oh, we can do that. I must have skipped over that at some point. So we can do that. Let's mm. start with, we'll just go in alphabetical. Agora? I don't have anything to update. It's early in the year for us. Hey, Kinden, Calabasas. Happy New Year, everyone. Just a, a couple updates. Um, since our last meeting, since our last COG meeting, the City Council of Calabasas has considered two major housing projects. One is the Caruso project that was approved by the City Council. And then most recently, a settlement of a lawsuit with a new home company, uh, reducing project from 180 units down to 76 family, single family homes. Uh, so those are uh, very uh, noteworthy in the sense of uh, in, in recent history, and we haven't seen projects of this nature uh, presented and, and approved by the council and moving forward. And so this is a big change in our community in regards to housing. So we just want you to be aware of that and appreciate um, uh, Jeff, who is providing some information uh, to myself and the other city managers regarding the state housing laws that, that we might be able to share with our constituents and residents on those matters. Penny? Sorry, I should have referred to Nate. <laughs> Good morning, happy new year. I'll, I'll keep it real brief. Um, just for the region, uh, the wildlife corridor, although a Caltrans project, um, we have been working closely with them on a variety of issues. And one of the things that will affect the area is there will be a, a, a larger detour that takes place in March. So I just encourage everybody to pay attention to the notices that are going out. They'll be during, deterring traffic off the freeway, uh, probably along the Gore Road. So it'll affect probably ourselves, Calabasas and Westlake a little bit more um, than the others, but just wanted to make everybody aware of that. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, President. Um, Nate, if you have the actual notice, since Caltrans isn't great at sending things to all the cities, can you forward it to all the city managers so we can get that out? I absolutely will, yes. Great. Thank you so much. Let's see, where are we? Calabasas, Agora, Malibu? Oh, no, Hidden Hills, sorry. Hi, everybody. I will introduce myself. I'm Marcella Marlowe. I'm serving as the interim city manager right now for Hidden Hills. Um, happy to be here. Happy to hear you all. Happy to have heard all of the updates this morning. The other city managers have given me a very warm welcome, um, and it's great to be part of this group. Um, Mayor, is there anything specific you'd like me to update anybody on today? No, thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Marcella. Thank you. Malibu and then Westlake. Uh, thank you, President, um, and good morning, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. I'll keep it brief as well. Most of my headlines have already been covered by other individuals. We appreciate all the support that we're getting, of course, from CHP and the Sheriff's Department to deal with uh, this monster issue that we're having out on Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, as Captain C2 noted, uh, we are having a screening of the documentary 21 Miles. Uh, that's going to be this week, and I am going to be joining Captain C2 and the producer of the film, Michelle Shane. Uh, it's a very powerful documentary highlighting the dangers uh, and tragedies of PCH. Um, I think that's it for us for now. And I'll ask Councilmember Grisanti if he has anything to add. You did a great job, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. We'll finish up with Westlake with Rob and Kelly. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, just keeping it brief as well. We do have a new mayor, Mayor Ned Davis, uh, and then the Mayor Pro Tem, Kelly Honing, right here. So that's exciting for 2024. Next week, I'll just uh, say that we're ha we have our annual goal setting session, which is a study session we do every January to sort of set the, the tone and some direction for the year ahead. So we'll have more to report on Westlake Village News at the next meeting. But with that, I'll pass on to Kelly. Uh, my ex our exciting news in Westlake is we are building four pickleball courts, which I have wanted for several years. So I foresee uh, the plan is awesome. They're under construction. I foresee a cog pickleball tournament 
in our future mm -hmm. um, since I'm big on social stuff. So uh, let's do it. Uh, we'll see you up there at the end of spring, early summer. You'll get an opening day invitation for sure. So, and that actually it. is very exciting news. It so. is. It's that we have never had any public tennis or pickleball courts in our city ever. These are the first four up at the Westlake Community Park up on the hill there um, in the parking lot. So it's very cool. We'll come for a tour when it's open. So um, thanks everyone for the updates. Our next COG meeting will be February 20th and the calendar of meeting dates is included in our current agenda packet. If there's no further business, I will adjourn the meeting.